Today, Apple, Netflix, and JP Morgan get name dropped in a list of FTX creditors. Senator Elizabeth Warren praises the SEC's efforts to wrangle the crypto industry. And Calanthea May of Massa Finance explains the future of soulbound NFTs. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World. I'm Tanea McKeel. Cryptocurrencies are turning higher this morning after two days of losses. By noon Eastern, Bitcoin rose about half a percent, trading just above $23,000. Ether, meanwhile, rising about 1% and Cardano jumping more than 3%. To get more context on the crypto market, we spoke to Brent Shu of UMI for his take on Bitcoin's outlook. Bitcoin and Ethereum prices, they're like an index for technological development in the crypto industry. It's essentially a call option on Web3 technology succeeding. And they're also leading indicators for other protocols and ecosystems. So in the broader crypto ecosystem, the market is anticipating something like the Shanghai upgrade for Ethereum. And in a way, protocol development has become more streamlined compared to the wild, wild west of style of development we saw in the early days of Ethereum. For example, from 2016 to 2019, there was never really a signal that Ethereum 2.0 was going to arrive. And there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, doubt about the ability to ship. Now, development times are just much more normalized and deadlines are met much better. So we've seen, you know, crypto markets are up 35% uh, since December. DeFi TVL is up 20% since December. So I attribute a lot of this to the maturity of growth and streamlining of software engineering. And so therefore markets are becoming more efficient. And so we're seeing some of this growth right now. I think it's mainly driven by institutions at this point. One indicator for this, I think, is the fact that we do see this divergence from equities. Uh, there's a slight decoupling in the secondary market. For example, uh, the Genesis bankruptcy in some ways was kind of a signal for the bottom. Markets indicated that the event was already priced in. There was also a lot of fear and doubt around Binance and Tether, such as in other cycles in the past. Though no major material failures were exposed, we're starting to need, see new VC funding rounds in the grassroots markets and also um, some more focus on layer two, side chains, alternative base layer protocols and bridges. And also DeFi is really proving to be a resilient alternative to CeFi counterparties like FTX, BlockFi, Genesis, Celsius and Gemini. And I think a lot of this is being driven by institutional understanding and analysis as they make um, more plays in the crypto ecosystem. Okay, let's talk about the top stories. First, the list of FTX creditors is finally out and it includes some pretty big names. The 116 page document lists tech titans like Apple, Google, and Netflix, airlines like American and Southwest, and banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Comcast, the parent company of NBC Universal, was also named among the creditors. Now, the documents don't say just how much exposure these companies have to FTX. It could be relatively small, but they paint a clearer picture of just how many people FTX owes money to. Next, Senator Elizabeth Warren just threw her support behind SEC Chair Gary Gensler and his efforts to tighten regulations on crypto. In an interview with the American Economic Liberties Project, Senator Warren condemned the crypto fraud investors faced in 2022 and said the U.S. has the tools to solve issues of fraud and under-regulation. The SEC. Warren praised the agency for its ability to put the genie back in the bottle and bring the industry under compliance. Of course, the SEC has grown its influence over the crypto industry in the past year and has turned to several high-profile lawsuits to assert its regulatory mandate over the space. Finally, Dutch officials just dropped a multi-million dollar fine on Coinbase. The Central Bank of the Netherlands fined the crypto exchange $3.5 million for operating in the country without obtaining the proper registration. Coinbase has a significant number of customers in the Netherlands and as a result of being unregistered has had a competitive advantage not having to pay the typical fees for supervision. That's according to the central bank's website. Coinbase is reportedly considering an appeal. All right, on to our main story. Last week, Masa Finance launched its soul-bound NFT protocol on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, these tokens, which are tied to one person forever, have long been touted as the future of NFTs. But what can they do, and why do some see them as the future of the internet? Crypto World's Jordan Smith spoke to Calanthea May, the co-founder of Masa Finance, to find out. 
Masa Finance just launched its Soulbound Identity Protocol for Ethereum last week. Walk us through this announcement and what it means. So a lot of people are familiar with the idea of a token, and a lot of people are familiar with the idea of an NFT. But what is Soulbound Token? Soulbound Token is a concept that was first evangelized by Vitalik in May last year in a paper called Decentralized Society, Finding Web3 Soul. Technically, Soulbound Token is a non-transferable NFT, and realistically, it is actually a Web3 passport that refers to a uniqueness of a user's Web3 identity. Here at Masa, we have been the first uh, protocol to launch Soulbound Token last August. Over the past five months, we accumulated close to half a million SBT mints, and last Tuesday, as you pointed out, we brought the idea of Masa Sovon identity to the Ethereum mainnet. Can you talk about some of the use cases for this technology and how does it change the landscape of both NFTs and Web3 and realizing that vision of Web3 being ubiquitous and, and controlling your own identity online uh, using a wallet or a token in this case? So imagine, again, the analogy of a Web3 passport. First of all, you have a name. It doesn't have to be your, of course, legal name. It can be a pseudonymous name in the Web3 world. It's a human readable address that refers to your Sobon identity. Much like ENS domain name, we have our Masa so name. And then you have a green check mark that authenticates you as a Web3 user instead of a bot. As we all know, bot is a very prevalent problem in Web3. I read a report saying that 40% of game five players are in fact bots. It is a huge problem that prevents the real growth of Web3 economy. And then we have utilities such as your financial identity, like a Web3 credit score. Previously on the show, I talked about how Web3 credit score can be used to create a more open and equitable financial system. That's what we're bringing to life um, on Ethereum mainnet. Using your Web3 credit score as a user, you will be able to apply for a DeFi loan from one of the Marcel partners. No matter where you are and no matter whether you are credit invisible in the traditional financial system or not. Um, there have been some big claims that this can shape credit score tracking, as you mentioned. There's been talk about um, deeds for uh, soulbound tokens, other sensitive information. Uh, if we're looking at how this can be used in our daily lives, how realistic is it that we'll see that kind of mainstream adoption and, and how quickly? I mean, if we're taking a skeptical look for just a second, what makes this better than using, say, the credit reporting bureaus or some of the financial information that banks already have? So when Vitalik first started to talk about decentralized society, that might have seemed to be a remote concept at the time. However, we proved that this is an attractive product with huge amount of momentum and curiosity through launching on the testnet and accumulating close to half a million of SBT mints. It shows that the community is excited to have a Web3 identity, have one single piece of identity that represents their user and wallet and authentic Web3 uh, identity across the entire economy. And when it comes to how Web3 credit score compares to traditional credit score, across the globe, there are over a billion people who are actually credit invisible. For example, both myself and my co-founder are immigrants, first generation immigrants here in the US. When we first got here, we didn't really have a high or even median level credit score. Over the past 10 plus years, we've really worked hard, made income, repaid our debt in order to build out credit score. This is not a rare case. This is not an exception. This is a common problem that is faced by billions of people across the globe. Their creditworthiness is currently not captured by the traditional financial system. We're pulling together more than 10,000 data sources across Web 2 and Web 3, everything from your Android mobile data to your on-chain activity to give it another chance, reimagine a user's creditworthiness in the Web3 world. I think this is quite revolutionary and it is a lot more inclusive compared to the TradFi credit score we currently have. Just taking a step back and contextualizing the launch of Sobon identity in general, 
Um, I think the next generation of users, let's talk about Gen Z and Gen Alpha. If we think millennials are digital native, I predict Gen Z and Gen Alpha will be wallet native. They will be so used to using a wallet as they travel around the on-chain, off-chain, online and offline world. They'll be playing games, earning badges, documenting their carbon footprint, accumulating a new financial identity on-chain. So wallet will be essentially their passport. That's the reason why we are putting a lot of bets on Sobang Token and how to build layers of complex identity around wallet and Sobang Tokens. Finally, let's talk about NFT space and the outlook there. We saw the uptick in Bitcoin, but what has the NFT space looked like? What, what have trading volumes looked like? What, what does sentiment look like among those who are investing? Yeah, I think, again, people are looking for utility in NFT. We have seen um, artists and creators really um, activate the first boom in the NFT market. Now what's uh, trending and what's popular is domaining. It's things that can point to utility and future utility holding the NFT. That's the reason why the launch of Masasone uh, as an NFT has been a success because people see the premise of using Masa so name, they can unlock future utility brought to them by Masa Sobang identity and Masa protocol. So I think even in the NFT space, utility will be a key word I'm looking forward to seeing more of in 2023. Okay, that's all for Crypto World today, but we'll be back again tomorrow. We'll see you then.